webinar of the series very serious of webinar uh, about uh, the war in Ukraine, about uh, how to fight Russian imperialism and colonialism, and what we can do with it as a uh, young greens and like uh, just uh, young people. Uh, this uh, series of webinar is a part of their um, annual working plan of CDN, and we are future, but we are now. This working plan is supported by European Youth Foundation and Council of Europe, and uh, it is our first webinar. Uh, in uh, upcoming weeks, we also will have webinar around sanctions, weapons in Ukraine, uh, city as a uh, battlefield about gender perspective for the war. Can you show me? Okay. So uh, we today have a, web a webinar on the topic. Okay. Oh, a webinar on the topic about uh, uh, youth mobilization at the war and how uh, young people participated uh, mostly in, as a volunteers uh, and the full scale invasion started and before so and uh, how it was and how it's going now and what we are. Like what will be for future. And today we have two speakers, it's Olena and Igor. Olena is from Ukraine, she's a sociologist and actually uh, volunteer in the Sergei Pritula uh, Foundation. And Igor, uh, Igor from Poland, from Polish Young Greens International Secretary. And uh, also is a, a founder of uh, NGO in Poland that fights it anti discrimination. And we will start with Olena. And Olena, can you briefly like, present your activities and your experience and how you, you like, experience it emotionally? And, yeah. um, hi, all. My name is Olena. I live in Kiev. Uh, uh, so just to give a quick start, so normally in uh, my like, normal life, I do a bit of scholar work, a bit of um, consulting work, and also I teach people stats. Uh, but after February 21st, I haven't given up my work because I still need to sustain myself, but I also started volunteering. And... Um, now I'm volunteering at the Serhii Fratula Foundation. That's one of the two biggest foundations in Ukraine. Second one is Come Back Alive. Um, yeah, so that's a pretty cool organization. And what I'm doing there now is I'm buying a ton of power generators. And uh, brujuika, brujuika is the term for heating stoves that uh, Ukrainian soldiers and civilians used to heat uh, the place where they live. Because in now, so soldiers usually, they don't have any heating options because they live in the field, while civilians often suffer from heat and electricity outrage just because of the strikes. Uh, yeah, so that's how the war migrated me from uh, scholar activities in sociology to buying a ton of burjuika and knowing what are the specificities and how we can pick the best ones. Um, yeah, but before I started volunteering at Serhi Pritula Foundation, I started it somewhere around end of March. I had a lot of maybe not that productive uh, volunteering activities. I was especially trying to get people medicines because uh, the war, especially at the beginning of the war, supply chains were broken and people in Ukraine, especially in the uh, places under occupation, and it's still a problem for places under occupation, even worse now probably, and near the front line, and even in the more or less peaceful cities, it was very hard to obtain certain medicines. And I made my goal to find it in Europe and somehow deliver it to Ukraine. And I'm saying that it was maybe non-productive because individual effort is, um, that's important, 
but that's also quite often can is it requires a lot of effort and gives very little result. Uh, but still, if you can help someone individually, just go for it. Um, yeah, and that's about my work experience. Uh, I'm not sure how, like, uh, how long should I be with this presentation because I don't want to take a scene for too long. You have up to 10 minutes, so you can continue. Oh, okay, 10 minutes, okay. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, so volunteering is not something new for me. Uh, I've been volunteering and doing some community work since I was in the in university. Actually, I so I am from that uh, uh, generation in Ukraine who started university and the revolution of dignity happened, and that really affected me a lot. Uh, that I think it's for me as a person because I was studying in Kiev and I was able to participate in the process. And uh, there were a lot of volunteering efforts, so volunteering was something natural for me. And I was doing mostly volunteering for uh, yours and for uh, different education initiatives. Uh, so yeah, my natural response to the war was to uh, try to help, try to make uh, all of this stress and horror for people around me and uh, those who I know and those who I don't know uh, less less terrible. And uh, I think that generally war in Ukraine now is where someone tries to find its own niche to be helpful and to contribute to the victory. And that's actually not that hard to be helpful and find the need because there are a lot of needs, a lot of people who suffer, a lot of people who are fighting and need some help. So I would say that it's a very inclusive opportunity for everyone to volunteer. And that's why maybe everyone volunteers, uh, virtually everyone. Uh, I have a friend in the neighborhood, she is 70 and she's super uh, active in volunteering although she hasn't been before uh, she's doing these different candles uh, that soldiers can light up in the blindages and crowdfunding money uh, for people she knows in the who are fighting for ukraine so virtually anyone is volunteering and uh, i'm also uh, here to help and yeah uh, and uh, uh, that's why at the end of March I joined the Pertola Foundation because uh, I felt that uh, joining a big organization, uh, a big volunteer center, uh, would allow me to do more and uh, to increase my impact. And I saw it as maybe more effective way to spend my time and effort. Um, yeah, so that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Actually, that you mentioned that uh, maybe individual help is not so important, but for example, I, think I spent more than once on occupied territory by Russia, and it happened not just uh, like I I could cannot prepare, so that's why people suffer there without lack of medicines or lack of uh, like base stuff and uh, actually we can rely only on volunteers that uh, just try somehow to bring it to our city and to help people that um, they use very needed these medicines for example people with diabetes they they need uh, their mm -hmm. medicines every day or people that uh, have a, a big, another like very um, life important um, health issues and uh, when while the government is more like busy they solving some uh, system um, stuff hard stuff volunteers can help you right now and right here and that using like uh, stuff that you needed 
right here. And uh, that's why such work is also very important. And in another dimension that uh, people, especially like uh, on Occupied Territory, I'm talking from my experience, they uh, feel that support, that you are not alone, like people that in, in Kiev or in Lviv, they are not uh, forgot about you. They are not just uh, like, okay, you are there, but we are now, we are in safe, but no, they, they are still not in safe, but still very help and try to help you. So thank you for your work. And thank you. That's actually a very fair point, Katya. And let's move to Igor. Igor, can you say how it was to like to see the, uh, the war, like the full scale invasion started uh, as you like as people abroad, especially from Poland, the country that helped Ukraine from their first hours, so they invaded so much and what what you did and what you are doing now. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, so so just for the context, like, like uh, in Poland, the most of the volunteering was done in the first five weeks of the war uh, because there were the most refugees coming to Poland during these five weeks. And it was like in late March, it was about 4 millions of refugees uh, in Poland. And only about less than 10% of them uh, needed to stay in some shared accommodation centers, so provided by state. And the rest of them just uh, was living in, in housing provided by people. And uh, the polls shows that about 70% of Polish people uh, was helping in some way uh, to Ukrainians. And also we had uh, most, uh, more than 600,000 uh, euros of donations from private hands, from like individual hands in the first three months of war uh, with a bit, with just a little help from government to, to, to refugees, like our government did well in the international politics, but, but help to refugees was, were not so good and uh, not organized. And uh, during these first five weeks, it was like very chaotic in Poland and we needed to, to have individual work and like organize from this individual work because uh, there were not or no organization and no local government in Poland was prepared for such scale of humanitarian crisis that happened in the border and happened in the uh, railway stations in Warsaw. So basically there was people, there were people needed to do like everything, like to be in information points. So just to tell people where to go to, to have some legal issues. There were people need to, to provide some short term accommodations, other people to provide long term accommodation, and like people to, to, to have to do, make a food for people uh, who are coming. Uh, and of course, there were a lot of, of co collecting of things for, for, for specific reasons. So, so basically, during these first weeks, it could be like like uh, that one day you are making food for refugees, second day you are uh, sitting in, in some place and collecting uh, medicaments from people and third day you are at in information point. Uh, so it was very chaotic and I mean, after like two weeks or something, the first uh, organized group of volunteers met to like provide more more, more specific uh, food or to provide the accommodation. So it was uh, the group Zasoby Warszawa uh, that uh, provided accommodation for more than 5,000 people uh, during the first five weeks. And it's official because there were also a lot of people um, who are just coming to the railway station and trying to help without the, the, the official. So it was like kind of dangerous for refugees because, because they don't know to what house they will uh, go. But uh, this 5,000 was like really verified by volunteers and, and uh, it provided good accommodation, but also it's very really official because obviously uh, I in my house, uh, house housed maybe three or four refugees and like in reality it was that 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 
I think about 20 people spent at least a night in our house, so, so, so much bigger than official data. And, and in Warsaw, it was like uh, finally uh, about 300,000 people coming to Warsaw, but of which about 80% stats show that they already have some accommodation from, from their friends, mostly from Ukraine, uh, or somehow provided. But this 10 to 20% people needed help directly. And like, for example, I was living very near to the railway station. So, so it was like just a help for people to come here, spend a night or, or take a shower. And it was like still really important. And it was uh, also the collecting of things, like various things in Poland was, was a big thing because um, like it happened in every institution, in every organization, there were some some collecting uh, because like people giving more things to, to, to organizations and institutions they know. So, so every university faculty has their own collecting and even if it was very small and, and ended with sending like one bus or one car to, to Ukraine or to the border, it still helped and in other way that people would not uh, go with that. Um, so this was this, the, mostly this uh, five weeks. Uh, since then, yeah, I was working a bit with uh, in, in information points at the railway station in uh, in Warsaw and also it's more provide people with information how to get accommodation but like official accommodation from the city because now it's less refugees so so it's it doesn't require a lot of work and uh, also going to the border a few times because it was also humanitarian crisis and like more often because people just crossing the border and there are other things and cannot talk a lot about that, I think, because most of them wasn't also fully legal, uh, to be honest. And um, yeah, now now most, and now it's also mostly a help with people with, not on such daily basis, but like there are still some collection on things when, when there are special needs from, from some Ukrainian partners, like, for example, collecting some specific medicaments and, and uh, it's, like just to provide some information to wider audience and like, uh, but most of uh, the work now is like really led by uh, Ukrainian community itself in Poland. And it was from beginning uh, because we had before there were like more than 1 million Ukrainians in Poland. And like it's of course was easier for them to, to, to communicate with people and uh, so 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 Polish people weren't alone in the fact that they don't need to organize themselves, but but there were natural leaders from Ukrainian community, which was like really good for us. And yeah, of course, it was like a really great example. And uh, there are now in Poland there is need for 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 many volunteers like on more constant more more long-term help in in some refugee centers some some this state provided accommodation or just at the border but it's like really difficult to to people when from other cities to like it would require to move them there so so it's a bit of problematic so still we have a bit of chaotic help and also after the big humanitarian organizations Leave, left Poland, left the railway stations. It it just like requires a lot of informal work to 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 provide food when we know that there will be like some train with bigger amount of refugees that that usual or something, and it's like just calling a phone and and like do a cooking for for one hundred people. So 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 it's still like really informal and requires individual wor work because because as I said like the more organized uh, help like the humanitarian organizations require like like basically full-time volunteers and and 
like mostly they have money for for employ people to do that so so like still volunteering is chaotic and like on the individual level thank you we see this transformation this uh, um, just reactive volunteer work to already some structural systematic work and hopefully people receive some like remuneration for this because there is still spent so much money and emotional capacities to this because working this especially this this very refugees it was not so easy emotionally and and okay, let's move to like, our questions here. And uh, the first uh, one that I also wanted to ask and how how it started to us, uh, to, to you. So then you, with the 21st of February, so uh, how you decide what you need to volunteer, what you need to do something, like did you um, like need some time to, to recover somehow? Because Igor said that you uh, met uh, people that came from like from the very beginning, and uh, how it was, how you decided to, to volunteer, how like how many uh, time from the invasion started it have its take. Who wanted to start? <laughs> if you want. <laughs> Um, so for me, it was like a natural uh, response to a situation just to stay sane. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, I also felt that, well, probably like for a week or two, I will not be able to seriously do work, uh, but I still need to be occupied and I need to help people and uh, like who knows what happens. Uh, tomorrow and whether we will be still alive because now it looks like uh, well you never can be sure that everything will be fine uh, at each uh, rate alert or something but generally I don't have a fear for my life and well-being while on the first week especially when Russian troops were closing closing in Kiev that was the case and for me, it was a natural response to start volunteering. Of course, I had some time to, I took some time to sort of uh, maybe calm down a bit and also figure out what to do, like for my family members and I don't know, buy some additional groceries, but that was like half a day. And then I started to look for like options to help and what is needed in the moment. Everything like that. And I also, I tried to, so at first I tried to look what I can be, what I can do in the distance, just not to uh, overcrowd volunteering centers or I don't know, some uh, train station or other hubs where help uh, were, uh, might were needed or might have been needed just be, so from the security reasons, just not to overcrowd such places. Thank you, Lena. Ingo, do you want to? Uh, yeah, I mean, also in Poland, like the refugees were for the first day of war, it was like hundreds of people just just in the streets and needing help. So, so like Polish people and they also started to work for, for the first day and, and like, uh, I think that it was just, as I remember, like someone calls someone that they are doing food because they need food. And also it was a problem that people don't know how to help first. And like, uh, so when I said that it was also, I think, in Poland that train stations or something were our crowd with volunteers and it was complete chaos. So, so, so just to find someone else and if something else like making food or, or or uh, collecting things or like just sorting of things that will go to the border or not to the border or to the Ukraine directly. Uh, so I think it was like since the beginning of war, like I 
basically we wake up with needing to help and like people asking for helping them in organizing help so so it wasn't like like very long time and but but yeah as i said in poland it wasn't also like really long time when we needed to be mobilized so so long so 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 it wasn't very problematic and like just to to add uh first refugees uh in in our house and like in the people provided accommodation like more, more professionally than just going to the railway station and uh, take some people uh was like about six or seven days after the beginning of full-scale invasion so so yeah it took about this four or five days to, to all system to start work yeah. and uh, what about your like, uh, friends or your family did they also help you does it uh, did they support you or maybe they volunteer with you how it was your like uh, social environment uh, around you it uh, everyone like uh, was like where like, uh, mobilized um or not or just uh, what people do, uh, do near you So I, I could just say simply that in Poland, basically everyone did the same, like at least in Warsaw, because of course in smaller cities there were like less help needed or, or less organized help, but basically less refugees. But but in big cities, I think that almost everyone, like depending on they the, how they could manage to, to to join it with work and 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 studies, but but yeah, like mostly everyone did the same. Yeah, I consider myself as living in a bubble of very specific social environment where quite a lot of my uh, friends and close people do some volunteering. But it feels like now the whole Ukraine is that environment and anyone is volunteering. And uh, I don't know, like... Uh, chat in telegram of residents of my home is often battling with some offers to do volunteer little volunteering and craft something for instance for soldiers or collect um, warm clothes for kids uh, who arrived from uh, the occupied territories and as we're here today um also it's such a bubble of people who are like um internationally uh, like international community from uh, different uh, cities from eastern europe and western europe here so we can also can somehow discuss how your like friends also your comrades from abroad how they react did they like uh, propose help how it happened <laughs> what what they do I have a dear friend from Krakow who is almost every week texting me and asking whether I have food to eat and whether they have a place to sleep. And uh, when I say yes, like, have you seen Kiwi news? It's like more or less normal. He still doesn't believe me. And especially during when Russians were closer to the city, he always asks me whether I have food to eat. And so that was nice. Uh, but yeah, so working, I have an quite an experience of working, working in the international firms and uh, I have people whom I know as work contacts from different places uh, really so I encountered a lot of reactions and not of all of them were supportive helpful or even nice like some people were texting me like have you managed to escape Ukraine and it's like escaping Ukraine is not like uh, an option in the first place. And uh, yeah, that happens. But mostly people are trying to help. Uh, they trying to cheer me up with an email, with message and also to uh, donate. Also, I should say that at least my international colleagues and especially people from academia, they are mostly trying to help for humanitarian aid and uh, do not, they are mostly a bit hesitant to donate directly to our fund or to our uh, other military 
connected initiatives. And yeah, so, but, you know, uh, I even stopped to try to explain to them that maybe donating to army is also important because at the end of the day, that's their choice. And uh, teachers from Mariupol who lost everything and came here to teach in Ukrainian schools, they also need support, it's like for instance, and to buy laptops to be able to connect through distance to learn and teach. So I'm just grateful for this help too. And if people don't want to contribute directly to the army, that's their choice as long as they support Ukraine and our victory. Actually, I had the, the same questions. Uh, yeah, I'm escape. <laughs> Did I escape occupation? Yeah, of course, it was so easy to escape occupation. <laughs> like, yeah, still met this some uh, lack of understanding of uh, the situation that happened now, and like even now, I noticed that still people abroad, like not from Ukraine, cannot completely uh, realize. But it is not just their fault. It's not their fault. It's just their situation. Like while you are not living it in this condition, you cannot imagine it somehow because you cannot, like living in 21st century, you cannot just imagine that, uh, that the war that uh, uh, Russia will use uh, phosphor bombs, for example, and it is just imaginary. Okay, let's move forward and uh, like as we, uh, we concentrated on their involvement on the young people so how you can comment on it uh, uh, what will be uh, how um, youth was in, involved in volunteering who was more involved like um, you know younger people or uh, more like um, older people what will be the most active people or mix or like what will who was Yes. Okay, so, so I think in Poland, like during first weeks, like young people were the most involved uh, just because like they have most free time and, and it's basically just like that and it was still very chaotic. It was so people were just going and asking things so, so I think it was easier for, for young people and also to, 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 to just find the information on the internet where something specific happens. Uh, so, but, but as I said, like virtually everyone was involved at least in Warsaw. Um, and like the situation now is like a bit harder to involve for young people, like except for, for this like, some not regular doing making photos something as I had done but 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 in the fields there is most need of help from Polish people it's like mostly adults because like for example going to the border uh, and even going with the humanitarian aid to, to directly to Ukraine requires driver's license requires car so so it's like not something that the young people uh, can do and also because of situation in work or school uh, like more experienced people adults can 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 most more often can afford like having some days off or, or just like talk with their bosses to 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 give them days off just to help you uh, to help and also like the thing was uh, that schools which was weird for me uh, uh, did not of, often did not justify by, uh, the not presence of people of students in the school uh, if they are going to volunteer so so it was a bit stupid for example like uh, when i was in the border for at the border for like three days or something i can go i could get easily like like days off in, in in my work so my boss just tell me yes of course you should help i am also helping and in school it was like oh yeah we encourage you but we'll not get justified so so i think it was problematic for 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 many young people 
uh, and now like the the type of help that that is needed like requires like being a bit of more than young people and and uh, uh, yeah, but 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 I, I think if there will be need for for something else, like still it's possibility of mobilization. I think people. Oh, I just, mm, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's hard to distinguish some group because it was. It, it feels like still virtually everyone is volunteering, but still I feel like uh, yours can be a bit more active just because, so I think that's, <laughs> so yeah, generally they're a bit more active. They have more energy and also for instance, when I noticed that, so when I was staying in Kyiv, when Russians were close to Kyiv, I noticed that it's a, like volunteer centers or uh, any like sport where help were needed. There were mostly younger people, and I feel like so my theory from talking to them and also to some people who left is that uh, these people didn't have kids and they were like had this luxury to stay in Kyiv and not. Uh, drive their kids out of the city because uh, yeah when russians were very close but that's maybe as a hypothesis but generally yes also i'm totally get igor's point uh, about how it can be actually harder for you to be actively in volunteering because firstly in school for instance or uh, when they are like junior level at the job they have less flexibility with the time um, that they can dedicate volunteering also young people quite often they have uh, like say people at the start of their career they do not earn that much they pay rent they have a lot of needs that should be met and they cannot really give up on work and go full-scale volunteering without getting paid because they will not just be able to sustain themselves and they think that for young people it can be very sensitive but still young people will and have, still are very active in uh, this for a lot of young people went to the front line um, both boys and girls and that's uh, terribly sad to see all of these uh, young faces from black and white photos um, in messages about the death at the front line. Just uh, like you already mentioned, that that's lead to like, the next question about emotional burn burnout and uh, like, did you like feel it, uh, how it felt, like what is, uh, can be like, war volunteering traumatic so how should we like who, how we should what we should do this and how to it um well i don't have a <laughs> recipe for how to cure it and how to avoid it but i've uh, i think that i had two such hard moments and uh, um I think that the most, uh, at least for me, so the hardest is, so the foundation where I'm helping, uh, so it mostly works not with individual requests, but with requests from units, because it's a large organization and we are trying to help with more expensive things and technical advanced things uh, to units, uh, because that's something that uh, small organizations can't cover and also soldiers can cover themselves, for instance, drones and optics. Uh, but uh, given that we do not really have resources for individual requests and still being a volunteer, I have a lot of individual requests that I'm trying to satisfy because uh, I really see that these people, like this person, need something. Uh, but I'm also, uh, like my resources are also very, very much limited. I'm not the foundation. I don't have, uh, I do not uh, really crowdfund 
from other people in Ukraine because I understand that there are a lot of competing demands. I'm only trying to get some help from my international friends, but still it's very limited. And that's a terrible feeling when you have to say no to the person who asked you for something and this person is also not that happy about this decision of yours. So that's complicated and I don't have any advice on how to deal with it. So if anyone in the audience has, I'd be grateful if you share or text me. Yeah, understand. And to eager to feel something like this. Um, I mean, like, we didn't really have time for burnout, like, first, like, as I said, in Poland, it was, like, only a few weeks of full scale volunteering, and, like, even if we were sad or, or emotionally bad, like, we're still not at war, and, and we can go back to our houses, even if they are full of refugees, and so, like, there is nothing comparing to Ukraine, so, so I didn't, I feel bad, but like it just happens and it doesn't mean a burnout and of course for people working like at the border or more professionally and the shared accommodation centers for a few months and they don't have help for government really much something they they got burned out and they talk with such people but they are also like organized psychological professional help of, uh, volunteer psychologists in Poland so, so yeah I don't have solutions but we also didn't have really that problem everyone can have emotions like even if you are like travel with the safe space you still it, it's, it's okay to feel some bad or good um, yeah, yeah. I can comment on that. Like, so I, I may, may share share one one because, like, like uh, in the first weeks, uh, like for example, we we in when making foods, we we realized like in Polish people that that when we are trying to talk with someone we know from Ukraine, and then then we just like are sad and we are worse and making food. So 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 people are getting hungry because of that, and we just need to stop showing emotions and care and it was like her decision but but just made it and i'm sorry for my friends that they just didn't ask them or something but 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 like there was need in this time so but yes yeah, still it was a few weeks and uh because you mentioned and uh, preparing food and medicines and uh, providing shelters and uh, now for uh, when I work on uh, work helping to military units and how you can uh, somehow describe this evolution of like or just transformation of needs like from what uh, it was in the very beginning and uh, uh, how what is, what is it now and uh, how people here just in our network how we can help what we like to which initiatives for example we can join or what uh, which narratives you can we can promote and what what we can do now and uh, like how it was earlier Lena, Igor, who wants? Oh, I thought that, that was a question for Igor. Okay, I can start. So, uh, like at the beginning of the invasion, there was a need you know, for virtually everything. Now it's still a need for virtually everything, but with some modifications. So I think that needs and also help became more specific and also uh, volunteers in cooperation with the state to be able to more or less uh, cover some of the needs for instance and that's something what for instance you know Taras Chmut, the head of the biggest volunteer fund in Ukraine, Come Back Alive, uh, says in his interviews is that at the beginning there was a big uh, need for uh, bulletproof vests and uh, helmets and uh, this was quite hard to find in the needed quantities while now together with volunteers the state uh, 
have has procured a lot of uh, bulletproof vests and helmets and is able to um, equip more or less every soldier with that so that's uh, less of a burden so to say for volunteers to cover and also a lot of different volunteers and initiatives has uh, developed and they can all uh, specify in some sort of help so for instance uh, here in Kyiv, in my area, there is a local initiative. It's called Sloma Kittens. So it's like um, Sloma is uh, the name of the neighborhood and kittens is cats. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and so they help to people who do mining. Uh, like, uh, sorry, how to say that? Um, so basically for people who are fighting with explosive stuff that Russians left uh, on the occupied territories. And that's important. They buy a lot of uh, specific equipment and that's a big need now in Ukraine and they are able to sustain it. That's great. Uh, so yeah, I would say that it's more specified and uh, yeah, but still we need quite a lot of different stuff. And what about uh, this uh, some uh, preparation for winter? Do like uh, still we have such a big uh, gap for you know, like uh, stuff for, for winter, like uh, warm clothes or just a generator? or oh, generator we need every <laughs> every time. But like uh, on what uh, which need uh, we like we can concentrate just now, not uh, on the this stage of uh, the war, but on this uh, season. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't want to bore you with um, information about power generators and heating ovens, heating stoves. But yeah, so that's very important. And also, I know that there are still shortages of warm winter clothes that some funds are covering now, They're procuring that, looking for it, giving it to the soldiers, and also soldiers' crown fund or buy for like with their own money that also sometimes happens like what we are trying to do in the foundation is we are looking for different options for heating uh, for both for military and civilians and buying and uh, we have bought already quite a lot of burjuika which is heating stove and uh, that's actually very simple equipment but that's super helpful especially in the field in small um not um, furnished places where there is cold and people need to get it warm uh, more or less quickly. I'm also buying a lot of generators and uh, since um, Russia has started more frequently to attack our electricity system, the demand for generators went uh, just striking and that's a bad news for us in the sense that there are less generators for uh, more money, but we are trying to, now we are trying to find them abroad and deliver here in large quantities. So yeah, that's very important, especially diesel generators. By the way, if someone knows where to buy abroad uh, diesel generators of small uh, power with a decent price, let me know. I feel will will be very, um, yeah. I will be ha very happy with that. Everyone should note it, please. <laughs> <laughs> Inger, maybe you also notice some uh, trends in Poland. Yeah, like like firstly, it took Polish people. I think like two or three weeks to realize that we really need to to fundraise for helmets or vests, and not only like just for clothes for people because yeah we need to help soldiers and so, so, so not only with weapons from the state but also like from ordinary people, and it was like a bit of change and then we really not only buy some some clothes but or food but but also like there were some collect fundraising or collect just collecting the money from friends to to buy one vest or one helmet to 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 do to, to 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 the transport 
that is going, but but it also like very fast were shortage in Poland of such things that also in the first week or so it wasn't fully legal to 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 to, to get with vest through the border it changed very quickly, but it was a bit of problematic during the first week and like most of the change was later really that that when there was more need for like such things as generator but but i mean the things that are a bit more expensive that that that's something that can everyone by it was like mostly organized by Ukrainian organizations like Ukrainski Dom or Euromaidan Warszawa that are doing better fundraising and they have of course better information what is needed now so so like it's changed really fastly from the collecting of things individually to, to like more than more rather fundraising for for the bigger biggest Ukrainian organization and now really yeah, yeah this in last days it's also visible that the start again to being some local some small collecting of warm clothes uh, so i think polish people realize it a bit cool and um... Actually, if you like uh, people who are speakers here, if you have uh, questions, you can uh, write it in the chat. I will read it. Or you can just um, raise your hand and ask. Let's wait a few <laughs> time where people may be typing. Or maybe uh, when I hear you want to like uh, add something like uh, what you uh, we are not asking, but uh, you uh, think that it is important to share with people too. We also have this space. Well, I would uh, first of all uh, would like to take this time to thank you for coming to this meeting and the fact that you care about Ukraine and you can even dedicate your time at the union to listen about something in Ukraine, about war in Ukraine and about help to Ukrainian people. So I think that means a lot and that's, yeah, that's uh, genuine. Thanks a lot for that. So, so I, I just thank also for organizing because it's the most important thing now and like West often forgets about that and we feel that like even like just giving an example that now it's only one uh, international train free for Ukrainians from Przemysl from the Polish border just to Hanover so, so it's really problematic and like thank you for organizing that and thank you for sharing your experience we have a question to lena uh, the question do you think the mobilization of the years in ukraine is contributed to the growth of the society as such and do you think ukraine is becoming uh, more inclusive It's uh, and um, here in uh, the same questions uh, that the West can do, uh, that West can do, it is for to eager. Okay, so so like 
first of all, like more inform like people from the West, I think, need to have more information policy, more, more, more like focus on information and like still protesting. So, so it will be not forgotten. Like even in Poland, the amount of information in Ukraine is less and less, but but still it's like the most important topic probably every day. But in the West, it's like even hard to 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 sometimes realize that not so far away there is full scale war. Uh, so like for ordinary people like spreading awareness, like using the money like to transfer it still for 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 organizations in Ukraine because they need it. And like doing it all the time and like using all the political power to to have like some some pressure of the authorities like we know how bad are some authorities in helping military like not even counting germany but but in other countries and like just all the political power makes more pressure and if we are political organization we need to be radical in that and we are all from most of us are from political organization and need to do that more and of course if you you have in some people of the west have time or have willingness like and don't want to risk in the in ukraine and don't want to risk their lives in war like i understand but like there are some places at the border that need also foreign volunteers so if you know someone like that like they could go to Przemysl or to Zeshov to, to volunteer for some weeks and it still be like really appreciated by them. I know even people from, like from Australia co coming from for four weeks because they cannot afford, of course, more, but, but it's still like something really great and that we cannot expect it. And, like more we need more of such people and we need more information and we need like more military help and also like just money and because it cannot be do only by few very healthy countries <laughs> yes thank you and uh Olena, are you with us no, I think it's still troubles this uh, our like, energy shortages, and even I um, like, uh, had to <laughs> not have electricity this time, but hopefully I, I have. Um, okay, so why uh, I'm gonna try to. Uh -huh. Hi, I will be speaking from the talk. Okay. Uh, did you hear our questions or I should it, uh, repeat the question to you? Okay. Um, it's no, questions. Okay. Do you think the mobilization of the years in Ukraine is contributed to the growth of society as such? And do you think Ukraine is uh, becoming uh, more inclusive? Um, well, First is definitely yes. I think that generally, yes, uh, mobilization is something that drives Ukraine forward. In the well, from my opinion, from the beginning of our independence, and uh, the my personal example is. Uh, revolution of dignity when as, as a country to uh, remove the regime that was starting to be autocratic and uh, to move further and i think it's very important because young people now taking a lot of responsibility on them they do a lot of community work and i i really want to hope that the activity during the war it will help them uh, later after the war 
to be Online, like interruptions, is uh, like internet quality. I think is built in Ukraine, and um, and that now they are able to gain uh, like down they will be able um, uh, institutions. I really believe in that, but I also don't think that uh, this. Can you hear me? Oh no! Yeah, now it's not better. And now again, the worse. Okay. Like maybe it's so be like more easier to you to write uh, like to finish your uh, results too. Okay, yeah, thank you. And we have uh, one more question from uh, new chat. Um, yeah, it. Um, um, I'd like to hear more about the work done on supporting on mental health of uh, like uh, people and young people in particular that uh, uh, were affected by the war. And yeah, I don't know either. Do you like can add uh, something here or not? I can, in any case, to to try to answer on it. It like in Poland there are some. With some psychological groups that are providing free psychotherapy sessions for sure, but it's like also volunteering groups and uh, I think it's mostly based on community, so, so I don't have much to say. Yeah, we also, from, like from my experience, uh, like recent months, uh, I noticed, noticed it more like any proposition to help, it also such a volunteer work um, to help people that uh, like on occupied territory or with uh, some soldiers that can also feel such uh, um, like um, psychological problems uh, because of this uh, stress and uh, like emotional overload. And uh, actually, yeah, we have some initiatives that propose. Um, like uh, free uh, mental uh, like, uh, like help <laughs> I don't know okay. and mental help but uh, there is some uh, psychologists that can uh, like talk with you that can uh, just at least be your like friend on some time and uh, yeah from the very beginning um, some uh, also doctors proposed uh, their help um, and uh, like you can uh, receive their like short consultation, but mostly people they are worried how to just physically survive uh, and uh, only then think uh, think about uh, mental health. And uh, but it is uh, was very nice to hear that uh, we had uh, a lot of initiatives and uh, private clinics that. Uh, like uh, gave a huge discount uh, for like, uh, patients from refugees for people from occupied territory or like uh, big discounts or even like uh, can help you for free and uh, it it's uh, like it also was uh, true for mental health uh, support I don't know can I answer your questions or not So do we have um, other questions or not? Can we? 
Can I add just one thing? Uh, yeah, I forgot completely about that when what in the question what can West do because it's not fully related to volunteering but also to my work. So I completely forgot about education. That that there are a lot of Ukrainian children in Polish schools. And like Polish educational system is firstly bad even for Polish children and is also not very inclusive. So there are starting some initiatives to like help these children to, to learn a bit, to have like some repetitions. I haven't heard yet about such initiative to like connect some international volunteers to have like, to provide some lessons of the, uh, foreign languages to, 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 to these children, but I think it will be started in a few weeks. So, so if I heard, I will for sure update it on the CDN chat, but like it's really neat because like the level of like also free lessons to, to, to we give to, 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 to Ukrainian children uh, are a lot. And it also was a lot before the war because of, Bit of, of, of education and system in Poland, but but now it's really increased and 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 like they just need help to to to, to like survive it as normal people and and just have the same level of education as other children. So yeah, I think the help from the West will also be needed from that. Thanks. Especially for kids that uh, cannot just join the education, they need to learn the um, local language, and uh, um, yeah, it's it's also not you know uh, not the same uh, entry position uh, because of uh, this, uh, but still, like, but uh, it it's very uh, nice for me, especially to hear uh, that uh, Ukrainian refugees to learn local languages on the countries that they like, uh, like that countries that provide them a shelter. So what somehow can uh, like divide um, us from this imperialism, uh, like citizens of this imperialist country. Okay, so um, if Elena or Elena sent uh, the answer, so I will read it. So regarding inclusion in society, it is more complicate, complicated. Uh, definitely the war brings unity and people from all groups are united uh, by the society to contribute to the victory. However, uh, where stress and honor also divides people. For interest, people of folk state in the city in the dangerous situation uh, different, uh, differentiates uh, themselves from other people who left uh, for safety. In my opinion, it is unfair to, and unproductive to divide that can grow and inclusive of some groups. I believe that uh, we as a society should take uh, as a challenge and try to mitigate. Thank you. And actually, I think here completely agree. And even like I move for like I escape occupation, but I still like feel some um this um I received this bad thoughts uh that oh you are like escape of occupation how you can comment on what we should do in like uh, on this situation or not but like I, I shouldn't feel guilty for you know, that I moved to like, from occupation and to, to to feel more safe but still like oh it it's for us it's still like we still need to make these uh, moral uh, decisions, uh, and it, it's uh, like it's not situation that we are were prepared by school or like for our daily life before the war, but something where you and we all need to somehow to to learn how to do this or our emotions and our thoughts. And yeah, I think we can 
end <laughs> our discussion, uh, discussion. So if you will have any other questions, so you can write it in uh, like go to Cindian or you can write in our chats and we will try to somehow to answer or to continue our discussion in uh, like this uh, written format. And thank you our speakers a lot. It was very insightful and fruitful discussion. So, and uh, join our next webinars. I hope it will be still such productive. And uh, yeah, thank you a lot. Have a, a safe evening and uh, good evening.